Hello, everybody. All you brave souls who ventured out in this terrible weather. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. How's everybody doing? It's like a gentle nod. I feel like maybe better than that, I hope. Well, anyway, I'm happy to see you. My name is Aiden Flax Clark, and um, I'm part of the team that brings you live from NYPL. Um, and I want to say hello both to everyone in the room and to everyone who's watching online tonight. Um, thank you, all of you, wherever you are, for being with us. Um, knowing how many things any of us can choose to do with our time, I'm really grateful that you chose to do this. And um, for what it's worth, I think you made the right choice. Um, we're here to celebrate a beautiful book with a remarkable array of contributors, many of whom are over here tonight. Um, so many that I need to get off the stage pretty quickly. Um, the book, of course, is Alienation, um, edited by Sofia Stefanovic. And uh, she's the mastermind of a similarly named series called This Alienation, um, which is a long running series of storytelling uh, at Joe's Pub, um, celebrating immigration and featuring true tales by authors, artists, comedians, and musicians about language barriers, cultural missteps, rumbles, romances, and more. Um, this is the, actually the perfect room to do this, and I realized when I came in because we do the um, naturalization ceremony in here each year. So this is a wonderful room to be sharing this book in. Um, also, uh, I saw when I was looking at the Alienation website that it looks like their first show in quite a while is happening soon on Friday, May 20th at Joe's Pub. So go get tickets. Um, you go to thisalienation.com to do that. Um, Sophia is going to be your MC for the evening, and I'm going to invite her up in just a minute. Um, she'll be welcoming many of the book's contributors. I think there are 12 here. Looks like 12. Um, each of whom will give you a little taste of their stories from the book. Um, I think each person is going to read about a page or so. Um, and of course, after you get those tastes, you're going to want the full meal, which you can purchase right over there from the library shop. Um, if you're in this room, if you're watching online, you can go on the event page uh, at nypl.org slash live, and you can also purchase the book there. Um, we'll mail it to you. And uh, whether you purchase it here or online, um, all proceeds go to benefit the New York Public Library. Um, of course, you can also check out the book from the library, and I'm sure everyone here has a library card. Yes? Because as, as everyone I work with knows, I shame people who don't have library cards. So I'm looking. Okay, no shaming tonight. <sighs> Fine, it's all right, yeah. Very, very welcome, of course. Any library card we support. And I'm sure they have this book too, so please. But you know you can get a library card here even if you live in Brooklyn. So, in far away Brooklyn. <laughs> um, so there are so many readers tonight, I'm not gonna go through their bios, but here in the room you have printed programs where their bios are. If you're watching online, you can read all their bios on the event listing, and I encourage you to do that. Um, There's just a couple of library things I wanna tell you about real fast before we get to the event. Um, first of all, tonight, uh, tonight's event is part of NYPL's second annual World Literature Festival. Um, it just started a few days ago on April 11th, and it runs through April 30th. Uh, the festival shines a spotlight on books and writers from around the world and reflects many of the languages spoken in the diverse communities that NYPL serves. Um, it also celebrates New York City Immigrant Heritage Week, which is this week. Um, and this event actually was originally scheduled for the fall, um, but it was delayed due to COVID. Um, and I really couldn't think of a better time and a better room that we could be hosting it in. So um, there's a lot to learn about the World Literature Festival. There are a ton of events. There's reading lists, a, a lot of stuff. Um, and to see all of it, you can go to nypl.org slash World Literature Festival. Um, Live from NYPL has more events in the festival. Um, coming up in a couple weeks, we have online conversations with Britt Bennett and Bernadine Evaristo, uh, and another between Jing Su and the Chinese speculative fiction legend Si Xin Lu. Um, so to see that and all the other events we have, of which we have many, I promise, uh, go to nypl.org slash live. You can read about them, and please register. Um, lastly, Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos, and of course by everyone in this room and watching online, all of our wonderful supporters and friends. Um, so thank you very much for your support. And with that, let's give the very biggest applause for Sofia Stefanovic.
Thank you very much, Aiden. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, hi. Uh, that is my son in the front row. He is responsible for my lost voice. It's not COVID. It's daycare. Um, I am, yes, so happy to be here in this beautiful building, um, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library, newly renovated. I have never been here. I'm so happy to be here. Has everyone, has anyone else been here? Who's, is it your first time? Hands up if it's your, it's everyone's first time. It's everyone's first time. Okay. So we're all equally thrilled. Um, I'm very excited to present this book to you. It is an anthology of writing, um, and it is a celebration of immigration. These are true stories. And today we are doing a kind of series of flash readings. So we're basically teasing you. Uh, the library has kindly asked some of our contributors, not all of them, but some of them, um, to read just a tiny little snippet. And when you hear the tiny snippets, you will be um, compelled to read the rest of the book. They're actually all quite short pieces, which makes it very page turning. Um, and wonderful reading. So let me grab my piece, which is on this chair, because I'm going to start off. It's quite hard being the first person, so I'm going to break the ice a little bit. So just wait one second. I'm going to step over here. Ha ha. All right. So this is my piece, and it's called Birth by Sofia Stefanovic. I gave birth in a New York hospital. I don't love new experiences, so the idea of producing a human from my own body in a city where I don't know many people, in a hospital system I'd watched scary documentaries about, was not something I was thrilled about. When I was a kid in the Australian suburbs at a sleepover, I'd work myself into a state, pretend to feel unwell, call my mother and tell her in Serbian that I wanted to go home. I'd leave my friends to the Australian things that freaked me out, coleslaw with sweet mayo, beds with top sheets, parents who drank beer and played charades instead of watching SBS World News and cursing about the war back home like my parents. I'd get back to our apartment, which had proper cabbage salad, cabbage, vinegar, oil, salt, ashtrays full of butts from cigarettes smoked indoors, and the, the topless portrait of my aunt that my mother displayed in the living room. Things so comforting, I'd go to bed as if my pillow was a cloud under my face, delighted to not be in Lisa's bedroom eating caramello koala chocolates. As my due date neared, I wanted to make that pick-me-up call to my mother. Here in New York, unfamiliar things abounded. A healthcare system loaded with hidden costs. My own body's changes. My partner, Michael, who is Australian, politely rejecting my baby name suggestions and looking concerned when I'd blast my Yugo rock playlist, songs from the era before the wars when Yugoslavia was still intact. Where was I hoping that playlist would take me anyway? For one thing, Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore. And even when it did, when my mother gave birth to me, she had to share a bed with another woman whose calloused heels scratched her under the sheets. It's not like I longed for that experience. No, as my due date neared, if there was any place I wanted to be transported to, it was to my bed when I was a preteen, when I had no responsibilities, let alone a soon-to-be child of my own, and I could stay up as late as I wanted reading a book knowing my parents and little sister were shouting distance away. Thank you. All right, next up, we've done a little switcheroo just to trick you. Uh, our next reader is not listed next in the program, but is listed third in the program. Please welcome to the stage, Andre Asiman. Hello, everybody. This is called the nostalgia bug. When you're a displaced person, there comes a moment when you realize you're not just displaced, or that this stretch of new land is not your home and may never be 
or that the idea of a home or of a homeland has now become a completely hollow, unfamiliar concept. The new home is unfamiliar, but the old home itself becomes even more unfamiliar, especially once memory and imagination have shared have started muddying the waters and have allowed the old home to drift further and further away from you. You are no longer an alien just to people who are no less alien to you, but you begin to feel alien to yourself, as if there is another you that was left in a cloakroom somewhere and for which you've lost the stub and you're just impersonating yourself as if identity itself is now in question or lies in wait for you in some other hidden dimension, as if you've lost your footing on planet Earth but are no longer sure that you ever had a footing on planet Earth. You are always going to remain a stranger among these new people. The language they speak, their sense of humor, which you can't begin to fathom, the strange currency they use, and the weird nicknames they give to each coin dime, nickel, penny, the way they respect or fail to respect your punctuality, the way they define space in a crowded subway car, the way they do or don't apologize when their elbow grazes yours in an elevator, the way they talk back to a film being shown in a packed movie theater, down to simple conventions that are considered polite in one world and unspeakably rude in another. Each one of these alienates you. You will always be alien here and eventually back home as well, should you ever go back, only to find you are no less of an alien in your acquired home than in the one that witnessed your birth. Alien, for those who need reminding, comes from the Latin word alienus, from alius, meaning other. You are other than who you are. You are another. As the French singer Georges Moustaki, my fellow Alexandrian, says, je suis un autre, I am another. You're defined really as a minus, as a not them, which ends up also meaning not I. Thank you very much. Andre Asiman. And by the way, we have the names of our performers coming up on this screen in case you want to jot someone down or in case you um, didn't quite get it as I pronounce them, but you can also see them in the book itself. Uh, and now may I introduce our next wonderful reader, Christine Yvette Lewis. Hi all, how is everyone doing? How is everyone doing? Yeah, come on, give me some energy, give me some love. Nice. I'm happy to have in the room with me tonight one of my favorite, two of my favorite people, Enrico and Baby Beck. I see you, Baby Beck. Love you. Love you. <laughs> so this is a little tattle tale around the nannying gig. I'm still a nanny. I came to New York summer of 89 from Trinidad and Tobago, a twin island that local refers to as Trinbago, a place where masqueraders float across an enormous stage in wire-bending costumes adorned with colorful plumes two days before Ash Wednesday to rhythms of calypso and soca on soil rich with petroleum, where tourists come to find leisure by pristine beaches to the sound of steel drums, plain sonatas and Frank Sinatra's My Way. Even hummingbirds, scarlet ibis and cockroaches twerk on fever pitch air as they take flight. The master Calypsonian Mighty Sparrow saucy refrain about Jean and Dinah working for the Yankee dollar, echoed from every bar and tavern on Charlotte Street. The old bards drank Old Oak and Johnny Walker Red, washed down with coconut water, all the while swatting fierce mosquitoes, a pan of cooked up rice with slivers of chicken ties and 
feet sat on a counter beside the bar for the famished among them. Not forgetting some fiery island pepper sauce to savor the meal as they spit stories of them Yankees who set up base in West Trinidad in 1941 and how this puny twin island wrestled the British for independence in 1962. Not forgetting son of the soil, Stokely Carmichael coining the phrase black power as he fought for civil rights in the United States in the 60s. As they say, the things that will make you cry is what Trinis laugh about. Hello. <laughs> Carefree, fun-loving people who really care. Mind you, if we had our way, every day in Trinbago would be carnival. How about that? <laughs> Two of my sisters were already making a life for themselves in the Bronx. And they would ever so often urge me to come to the States. My daughter had just turned four. And I was finessing and updating my preschool knowledge to help her along. On top of that, I was teaching literacy classes in the evenings while trying to develop my knack and love of ballroom dancing. I knew I had it in me to be all that I could be, dancer, musician, actor, writer, organizer. America would be ready for me. The expansive stage of Broadway could handle me, or so I thought. My sisters knew I had it in me too. Thank you. Christine, Yvette, Lewis. I cannot tell you what a delight it is hearing these pieces again. Um, I, and do we have some people from Trinidad and Tobago in the audience by any chance? <laughs> yes, we do. Um, yes, it was such a delight to get to work on these pieces with these amazing authors. And um, it's, it's such a joy hearing them uh, read again. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Our next reader is Abia Hawk. Please make her feel welcome, Abia Hawk. This piece is called On Modesty. A recent trip to Bangladesh made me think about the concept of modesty. Modesty generally refers to being unassuming or moderate in one's behavior or comportment. In my Bangladeshi Muslim immigrant family, modesty has always been about what we wore, modest dress. In Islam, both men and women are supposed to dress modestly. But as we all know, rules apply very differently to men and women, no matter what religion you are. My little brother could wear pretty much whatever he liked. But for my sister and me, modest dress meant no short skirts or shorts and definitely no cleavage. As a teenager in Rust Belt America, I subverted these rules as much as I could. I left my house each morning wearing long baggy sweaters and jeans. Before homeroom, I'd go into the bathroom, which was filled with girls shaking giant aerosol cans of hairspray, spraying their permed hair. This was the 80s, so these weren't the trial size beauty supplies, but huge cans of Aquanet that girls would lug around in their purses, kind of like 80s mace. I'd sneak into a bathroom stall, unpeel my modest layer of clothes, and then waltz off to class in whatever midriff-bearing top and miniskirt I had stolen from the mall. I'm sorry, but I was an incorrigible shoplifter in high school. Don't tell my parents. After school, I'd head back to the bathroom, put my modest layer back on, and get back on the bus, back into size. Thank you. A beer hawk. Can I, I? I'm not sure if anyone has their phone on that is making a little beepy noise, but I wonder if you do, if you could maybe put it on silent. Just a little reminder about that silent button. There it is. That's the one. Just put that on quiet or silent. All right. 
Our next reader is Mahohodi Makene. Round of applause, please. Hello, hello. So beautiful being here. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm South African. I'm from Soweto. And this story is called Don't They Have Irons in America? It's echoing. Am I sounding OK? Yeah. OK, awesome. It was one of those plastic suitcases sold as a bona fide knockoff at Oriental Plaza. A purple bag with hard shell and zero compartments. My mother bought it using money that had more pressing jobs like getting groceries and paying for school fees. The suitcase carried the smell of ghee and fried peas in samosa triangles, plus that clean, crisp feeling that is Johannesburg in the clutch of autumn. My life arranged itself neatly inside. When it came down to it, all I hauled to America was a few changes of clothes, fresh towels, and a year's supply of toiletries. No joke. I had enough toothpaste, roll-on deodorant, and Nivea body lotion on me to boost a whole fucking bodega. <laughs> At some point, my mother wanted to buy me an iron. My grandmother, my mother's mother, a woman who only left her house to bury an important relative or to see about a new young doctor all her friends raved about at Baragwanath. She laughed. Don't they have irons in America? She asked. Her son, my mother's youngest brother, my cool uncle Benny, who must have been growing his first stubble just as I was born. The heartbreak hustler with forest thick jerry curls, a la Jackson 5, honey, and a tongue as slick as a snake. He asked me, aren't you scared? That question still stays with me. Because to me, at 17, Benny's whole life seemed to outfox fear. Take that one time we got stuck at a garage late at night. We were moving from Soweto to a white suburb under cover of dark. I was 10 years old, my father very freshly dead. Suicide. His family blamed my mother. She fretted, felt they had too much fertile energy for foolishness. This was a woman who'd taken to sleeping with an okapi slip joint knife under her pillow, just in case. All around us, tension was tightening like a sticky blood clot looking, locking around a heart. Thank you. <laughs> Mahohori Makene, everybody. <clears throat> Next up, I would like to welcome Matt Wynn. Hi, Matt. Hi, everyone. This is called Leaving Cabramatta. The last time I went back home to Sydney, a guy in a bar sneezed, looked over, and said to me, I guess I'm allergic to Chinese. I wanted to tell him, but I'm not Chinese, not really. Maybe half Chinese if you added up the quarters from a little further back in my family history, but I don't really have any connection to my Chinese ancestry. I'm more Vietnamese, but only because of my last name and, and my face. I don't speak any Vietnamese. I was born in Australia, but I grew up surrounded by Vietnamese people, but I've never been to Vietnam, spent my whole 
childhood in Australia, but no one asks me about the Australian experience, even though it's the only thing I've known. It just seemed like too much effort. I didn't think he cared. Not really. So I just laughed it off like I was in on the joke, on myself, finished my drink, told myself it didn't matter. I hated that it didn't matter. That explaining myself was too much of a bother. My parents were refugees from the Vietnam War. After the fall of Saigon with my brothers, who were one year old and three months old, um, they fled on boats, escaped pirates, and waited in a Malaysian refugee camp for two years until they were resettled in Australia where I was born. I grew up in a suburb called Cabramatta where migrant hostels had been located since World War II. New arrivals would be directed there for temporary accommodation in repurposed army huts. As migrants resettled from the hostels into the surrounding area, the community's composition changed. According to the international conflict of the moment, at various times it was Italian, Yugoslavian, Polish, and Lebanese, but the Cabramatta I grew up in after the Vietnam War was heavily populated by immigrants from Vietnam, China, Cambodia, and Laos. Australia had only just formally ended its racist white Australia policy in the 1970s. The policy was a series of laws designed to exclude non-white immigration to Australia after Federation, the birth of the Australian nation. When my family arrived, Australia emerging from decades of xenophobic ideology was ill-equipped to support migrants of color. Communities like ours bore the brunt of Australia's multicultural experiment, where multiculturalism largely meant assimilation and integration, while at the same time isolating communities of migrants in enclaves without adequate infrastructure, social support, translators, or community services. But ours was a community of survivors. People would borrow and raise money through neighborhood banking pools that operated out of homes and garages so they could avoid banks, which they felt impossible to deal with without recognized accreditation, job, or language skills. People pulled for private security for businesses and organized groups to walk to work together. Some of my friends' parents sewed clothes for sweatshop rates in their garages for clothing stores they'd be uncomfortable entering. Matt Wynn. Thank you, Matt. All right, our next reader this evening is Sochil Gonzalez. Hi, um, I'm Sochil Gonzalez. I'm a diaspora Rican, so I'm honored to be here, included in this. Um, and I'm reading from a piece called La Limpia. The day that I sat in the waiting room full of other cursed women, I did not know exactly who had cursed me, but I was doubtless I'd been blighted. My heart had effectively stopped functioning, you see. Everything it touched turned to terrible shit, and also inexplicably I had a pain in my hip bone any time I tried to dance to reggaeton, which in those days was quite often. I suppose no one ever truly knows who curses them. It's all speculation. Gentlemen's witchcraft, the kind with robes and wands and boarding schools where the person looks you in the eye, points their wand, and curses you to your face, that didn't happen much where I'm from. Magic had been driven underground, generation after generation, so that now when you heard about it, it was almost always whispered in the negative, usually related to, as in my case, a harmful curse. Always anonymous. Of course, I had my suspicions as to who had hexed me, namely my soon-to-be ex-sister-in-law, who had rumored ties to Haitian voodoo, which, though loose, weren't loose enough for my taste. I concluded that Haitian witchcraft was best countered with a strain derived from another part of that same island and found a sendera from the Dominican Republic who saw patients in the Bronx. I don't want to say that there are more brokenhearted women in the Bronx or anything. I mean, who am I to say? But I will say that in El Bronx, the good senderas have such volume of business that they run their shit like an HMO and you need a referral to even get an appointment. At Sylvia's, Mondays and Wednesdays were diagnostic readings. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, standard treatments. Fridays were for miracles. I did not eat a Friday ritual, and for that I was very grateful. Thank you. <laughs> so, Chil Gonzalez. Is everyone having a nice time? Good. I'm so glad. Um, 
Next, I would like to introduce you to Rufat Agaev. What's up? Gonna take my hat off for my mother. You know, she's always like, you got such nice hair. We got the cap on. Um, you know, if she's watching the live stream, she's not. Um, my name is Rufat. Uh, I'm a Caucasian, a real Caucasian. I was born in the Caucasus region of the world in Baku, Azerbaijan. Uh, when you look at my, when you look at me face to face, you know, you, you think, uh, you know, that's a regular white guy. Um, but when you see the like side profile of my nose, you'll say, yeah, they don't make those here. Uh, my nose is aerodynamic. It's uh, made for mountainous regions. It's like a spoiler on a sports car, uh, but for my face. Uh, I have a fast and furious face, is what I'm trying to say. You might see white people perform on this stage tonight, but no, I'm the only actual Caucasian. So. In 1992, uh, my mother, father, and I fled a war that was happening between our people, Armenians and the Azerbaijanis. My mom's Armenian, my dad's Azerbaijani. Uh, fleeing a war sucks, but I like, to think I, I like to think of it as something positive. Uh, fleeing is just an advanced form of traveling. Uh, we came to the U.S. in 1992, and I started life in Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie was the type of small town that made you want to go back to the war. <laughs> um, if, you, if you wanted to do something fun in Erie, your choices were either go to the woods or go to the mall. Uh, I remember as a kid, we'd visit um, Pittsburgh, uh, and my mouth would drop as soon as I entered the city because they had these like humongous skyscrapers. Not many, but enough for me to feel like I was in New York City. And uh, that's the only way I can describe Erie, Pennsylvania, is it makes Pittsburgh feel like the Big Apple. <laughs> um, Starting school wasn't easy for me. My first year in kindergarten, uh, I was in ESL, English as a Second Language. Uh, two of my friends dared me to keep saying uh, gavno to the teacher, which means shit in Russian. Uh, sorry, for, that's crass. Um, she eventually found out the, the, word that I, the, the word that I was saying, and I kept saying, and I had to uh, repeat kindergarten. Having to repeat a grade, <laughs> I think, you guys find that funny? Okay. <laughs> I also did five years at Florida State, so, for sociology, so, it's a repeat offender. Um, but yeah, uh, having to repeat a grade sucked, but not as bad as telling my new American classmates my name and where I was from. As an adult, I struggled to explain where and what Azerbaijan is. Imagine doing that when you're six. Also, a name like Rufat is ripe for remixing. Uh, one alteration, I don't know, it could be something like roof art. Um, <laughs> when I would meet new kids outside of school, I would lie and tell them my name was Michael. Moments later, they'd be like, hey, Michael, and I would forget the answer. <laughs> As a seven-year-old kid, my first taste of American culture was Shaq. I was uh, mesmerized. His movies, Steel and Kazam, I bought his rap album, Shaq Diesel. I played his video game, Shaq Fu. I ate his food, the double-decker taco at Taco Bell, and uh, drank his drink, all sport. I wanted to be Shaq. I wanted to be a seven foot two, 325 pound black man with a size 22 shoe. I remember telling my grandfather I would become a basketball player, professional one day. And uh, he's Armenian, and he was like, look, you gotta, our, our, our Armenian people, our bodies aren't made for the rigors of the National Basketball Association. <laughs> you should try a, a sport that we're built for, uh, like chess. <laughs> Thank you. Rufat Agaev. Next up, we have Roxanne Fekier. everyone. Um, this piece is called An Island Unto Herself. And just to give a little bit of context, I spend a lot of time thinking about islands. I'm 
I currently live on the island of Manhattan, which gets a certain response based on who you tell that to, but I grew up on Staten Island, which gets a very different response based on who you tell that to. I once told a group of fellow high schoolers from all over the city that I was from Staten Island and they booed. <laughs> but my mother and my father are from the island of Haiti, and that also gets a very different response based on who you tell that to. So this is kind of about all of those islands and isolation and a lot of mother-daughter tensions. So, the problem wasn't what my brother said, but rather where he said it. Exposed beneath the harsh lights of an A&P checkout lane, he'd made a motion towards some candy in arm's length from the shopping cart where he sat and asked my mother if he might have some. Her attention was elsewhere, so he called to her by her name, not mom or mama, but her given name, Marie. My brother was only repeating the name he'd heard his parents use at home. They hadn't bothered to call each other mom and dad, and so neither did their child. At this point in the story, the way my mother tells it, she pauses for effect, cringing to illustrate her decades-old discomfort. Now all these white people are looking at me funny, wondering whose child I'm shopping with, she says, the sharp edge in her voice belying the smile on her face. It's a story that neatly encapsulates the casual comedy of moving through the world with a young child in tow. But it's clear that the memory of those strange looks still stings after all those years. When they got home, she told her toddler, gently, but in no uncertain terms, that he really ought to start calling her mommy. I believe this anecdote took place during the early 80s, a few years after my parents had gotten married and moved from Brooklyn's Prospect Heights to Staten Island. By their account, the decision was a logistical one. My mother, one of six children, wanted six of her own. In the end, she had three. On Staten Island, she could have a whole house in which to raise them, instead of the cramped apartment that she and her family had crammed themselves into upon arriving in Brooklyn from Haiti years earlier. Long before overpopulation clogged the Staten Island Expressway and crowded its schools, my mother recalls the island's abundance of open space with a touch of wonder. Here was a place where she could, at long last, spread out a bit. Thank you. Roxanne Fekier. <clears throat> Next up, we have Clavis Natera. I took a big risk with these heels, so I'm glad I didn't fall on my face. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sophia, for having us and for giving me this opportunity to be in this anthology. It's a really beautiful book. Um, I'm going to read to you a little section from an essay called The Inheritance of Bone, which is about my brother who was arrested and deported when I was 16. 1992. Summer, and with no AC in our Harlem apartment, the days stretched hot and humid and endless and boring because we were supposed to stay put, not hang downstairs during mommy's 12-hour shifts as a home attendant. Our stepfather had finally gotten a job in a restaurant somewhere far away in Queens. He was gone most of the day, most of the night, and we preferred it that way. There was only peace when he wasn't there. That summer in particular, it felt so good to be free. Our older sister, Chani, had been kicked out and lived with friends in the Bronx. And if mommy was in a good mood, we sometimes got to visit her on the weekends. An older stepsister had also been kicked out. We never heard or saw much of her, which was fine by us, and she was always a snitch. Lindo, our older brother, had gotten locked up and was somewhere upstate. So out of seven children, only us four youngest kids remained, me the oldest at 16, and Evelyn, my sister, the youngest at 14, with a pair of step-siblings stair-stepping between us. We'd perfected pancakes, bun cakes, donuts. We hung out of the fire escape window, looked through those bars, bopping our heads to the merengue, booming out of double parked cars. We tried to remove the child locks from the other windows so we could all hang our heads, but we failed and instead had to push each other out of the way 
to feel whatever breeze happened by, carrying the deliciousness of fried pastelitos being sold out of hot dog carts. Whenever the phone rang, we listened attentively. If it was mommy calling to make sure we were staying put out of the trouble that lurked outside, the phone rang normally. We snatched it up, knowing that it signaled the freedom to run outside. She only called us once a day. Once downstairs, the three younger kids would rush to the park or the public pool or hang around the block while I stuck close by, always watchful, always a book under my nose. If it was my brother Lindo calling from prison, the phone rang, paused, then rang for several shorter bursts. That ring we let ring a while, or we didn't pick up at all. Truth? It was hard to talk to him. What do you say to your brother in prison? Thank you. Clavis Natera. Is Tatenda here? You are here. Excellent. Our next reader is Tatenda Nguaru. I took a risk with the heels too, but it's fine. Um, before I read, I've said this to you so many times. It's such a privilege that as immigrants we get to tell our stories. It's not lost in me what a privilege that is. And it's not also lost in me how many stories that need to be, the bodies need to be exhumed to be able to tell them. I know there's so many people who would have wanted to tell their stories and they did not get an opportunity. So I'm so thankful, and I think I speak for every panelist that we're really grateful. And thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is from a piece called True Identity. My name is Tatenda. I was born in the sex. And for those who do not know what that is, it is a condition when a child is born with ambiguous organs and the doctors cannot tell which sex the child is. Some intersex people have less obvious variations and never know they are intersex. Estimates say that as high as 1.7% of children are born with some variation to their reproductive anatomy. I came to America seeking asylum because in my country, my condition is regarded as shameful and a laughing matter. Also, because being intersex is tied to the LGBTQ community, it is regarded as illegal. The Zimbabwe government carries out campaigns against LGBTQ people, and there are no protections against discrimination and violence. Intersex people are bullied and convinced to never reveal their true identity, which causes rejection, endless pain, and often suicide. When I was a child, my parents did not know the term of my condition was intersex. In Zimbabwe, we do not have doctors who are specialists in this field. So they did not have advice or information for my parents when I was born. Because it wasn't affecting me health-wise, my parents decided to raise me as a boy. I mean, big mistake. <laughs> they were confused, but as parents, their instinct was to protect their child. They, have, they always showed me love and tried to protect me. I got my first period when I was in school wearing a boy's uniform. In Zimbabwe, boys have to wear boys' uniforms and girls have to do likewise, which is annoying. When I got my period, it was evident to my parents that I was a woman, even though I knew that already. I never doubted it. It's just that I didn't have any tangible information to prove it. So having my period was, in the words of my Shiro Miss Oprah Winfrey, an aha moment. <laughs> I had to change schools that same week because every student was bullying me and drawing pictures of me on the boards and making fun of my body. At the time, my parents convinced me to keep living as a boy. They did this to protect me 
because they knew the community wasn't going to be kind. The reason why I'm standing here is because of my parents. I cannot imagine a world where I could have survived without their support. Thank you. Tatenda Nguaru. And I just want to say, Tatenda, thank you for your for your kind words at the beginning as well. And um, I also want to say it's true that that uh, you know there aren't that many um, books that celebrate immigrant voices, but there should be. And I think that um, it's very exciting that we have our anthology and that more and more we are seeing um, diverse voices being published, and that that's something very exciting that seems to be happening. So um, I'm very excited that we got to be part of this particular book and to, and very honoured to have all of you in it. All right, we have one final reader for this evening and then I would like to welcome you. Um, you can buy books over there, as Aidan mentioned. You can also get a library card over there. If you don't have one, it's okay because there is a little stand. Oh, is there? Maybe he's gone. There was a person who was um, allowing people to get library cards. And then um, – our contributors will also be signing, if you would like, your book signed. They'll be signing here in the lobby. Um, and there are also some other contributors who didn't get a chance to read today but who have brilliant stories who I have spotted in the audience and even they can sign if they would like to. So um, I would like to introduce our final reader for this evening, Suketu Mehta. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, as the last reader, I'm the only person standing between you and your dinner. <laughs> so I thought I'd read for 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, I'd like to acknowledge my friends, Kathy and Elizabeth, visiting from Pittsburgh, North Carolina, and my friend Sujata, visiting from Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm a Queens boy myself, and I'm going to read a piece about Queens. I came to Jackson Heights, Queens, from Bombay when I was 14, or Jackson Heights, as we South, Asi in South Asians call it. My parents put me in the nearest convent school because the Christian schools in India were the good ones. I was fresh off the boat, and they put me in an all-boys school in which I was the first minority. I learned to run very fast. So I'm sitting at this table eating my lunch by myself because no one else will sit with me. And this boy with red hair and freckles comes up to me and says, Lincoln should have never let him off the plantations. <laughs> and I say, but what does that have to do with me? I had only one friend in my first year. And I lived for the Saturdays in which I would take the bus to his house in Middle Village. The next year, Another minority joined me in the school. I'm walking down the halls and someone says, hey, Maida, there's another Hindu in school. The new kid turned out not to be a Hindu, but a Jain, but my classmates weren't cognizant of such fine differences. <laughs> and that was the boy who remains my best friend, Ashish. We went through fire together, dealing with teachers who called us pagans and students who thought we were everything there white parents were resisting in Queens in the 1970s. There was nothing micro about the aggressions we endured. But then, in my junior year, for no particular reason, a bunch of other misfits joined the school, and we had an entire lunch table of the excluded. So there was me and the other Hindu, who was actually a Jain. There was Gilberto the Cuban, who claimed that his father was one of the Watergate burglars. There was a very short Irish angel dust addict named Quinn. The other kids called him a midget. We called him the mighty Quinn. <laughs> there was the school's only out gay boy who was having an affair with the, the math teacher and an Indonesian who was obsessed with cars, the gorgeous mosaic of misfits. Everyone wanted to beat us up. <laughs> but at the lunch table of the excluded, we also had Hansu Kang, 
the mysterious Oriental. He was a Korean student whose mother would pack him noodles every day for lunch. He would eat his noodles in silence, just looking this way and that and not saying anything. And see, since he wasn't saying anything, we'd say all these things about him. Kang, man, he's into that martial arts shit. You hear about the black belt? Well, he's got a belt that's so secret, he can't even tell you its color. <laughs> so everyone stayed clear of us because they didn't want to fuck with Kang. <laughs> he was actually the sweetest guy who wouldn't hurt a fly. He went to engineering school at Columbia. <laughs> Thank you. Suketu Mehta, everyone. A big round of applause for all of our readers tonight, please. Thank you for listening. If you would like to read those pieces to the end, which actually I'd say people read about halfway through. They're, they're rather short, but they pack a punch. Um, you can get the book over there and please uh, stay around and say hello to us. We will be floating around chatting. Um, thank you so much to New York Public Library for having us and for uh, this event in this beautiful space. My name is Sofia Stefanovic. Our book is called Alien Nation, 36 True Tales of Immigration. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>